the, the, the topic of, of, of this talk is a law without a lawgiver, question mark, why natural rights require a divine source. Essentially, what I'm going to offer to you this evening is a kind of argument as to why I think you ought to believe that the moral law, if there is a moral law, depends on God for its authority and existence. So let me say a few things about uh, some of the, whoops, not working. It's, all right, okay, good, whoops, right. This is all new for all of us, isn't it? Uh, I've already got Zoom stories I can tell you about my classes at Baylor. Um, so, um, the subtitle is, Why Natural Rights Require a Divine Source. So let me say, let me just, briefly define what natural rights are. And then I'm going to move on to discuss uh, how they're connected to the idea of natural law. We're going to go over many concepts this evening, each of which, to a certain extent, we can actually have independent lectures just on those concepts. So I expect uh, from you guys, questions uh, perhaps about those concepts, clarifications, and so forth. So, um, so let's begin. Natural rights. What, what is a natural right? Um, or what is uh, a right? Um, uh, a right I that one has by nature that a government is obligated to recognize. Um, but a right. So let's think about what, what some of our, we think of our fundamental rights in, as citizens of the United States. We think of the freedom of speech, the freedom of religion, the freedom of assembly and association and so forth. Those are legal rights. Those are what are sometimes called positive rights. They're called positive rights because they are posited by human governments. But we, we like to think that they are tightly tethered to something beyond those governments. So, for example, freedom of speech. Why would freedom of speech be good? And you could think of several reasons, right? Well, speech is a way to communicate. Communication involves knowledge, and it's good that human beings could, can know. In other words, it's, part, it's a good, it's, it's good, in fact, for human beings to acquire knowledge. But it's also good to communicate because it may lead to things like friendship. In fact, in, in, in a way, communication is one of the, the best way to facilitate friendship, which is, which is itself a good. Freedom of religion. We think of religion typically as connected to those things that are sort of beyond human understanding, those things that are transcendent, right? And so if human beings are ordered towards an ultimate good, it would seem that having something like freedom of religion protected by a government would be a good thing. And so any one of these rights, uh, that these sort of positive rights that we can think of, we tend to, if we really kind of reflect on it, we tend to think that they are kind of not, not simply good because the authority says so, but we think of them as sort of independently good in some way or another. So, so, what about the idea of natural law? So, so it, it seems to me that a natural right or natural right presupposes a natural moral law. Um, so what do, what do we mean by natural law? Natural law is the idea that there are fundamental precepts to which human beings are obligated to to abide or obey. So here's a kind of very brief way of, of sort of connecting the idea of natural law with human nature. There are some universal and immutable moral truths. Human beings have the capacity to know these truths. Human nature is the basis on which these moral truths are known. So, for example, uh, 
the belief that courage is a virtue, uh, at least according to, to most natural law theorists, or cowardice of vice is a universal and immutable truth of the natural law that humans, human beings have the capacity to, to know, and we know this on the basis of human nature. Well, what do we know about human nature? Well, that human beings are rational creatures in the sense we have the ability to reason, um, but we also have other sorts of inclinations as human beings. We have certain passions, right? Certain uh, movements of our emotions. And when you think about something like courage, courage is a kind of way of understanding how to act reasonably while mastering those emotions, right? Between, you know, fear and foolhardiness, right? So, so those traditional virtues, at least, come about as a consequence of reflecting on this aspect of human nature. Um, we often try to justify the positive law by appealing to the natural law. So think about uh, governments that issue statutes on matters like, like murder, um, theft, assault, and child abandonment. Governments make policies on those matters because they believe, governments believe that the common good is protected in some way. So when somebody says something like there ought to be a law against it or we should have a law, they're presupposing that there is a kind of moral insight that they've acquired that should be reflected in the positive law. And that's, a, that's an example of the way in which, at least according to the, the natural law tradition, human beings apply the natural law. Um, it's the, it's, the natural laws also uh, can be found um, in a very famous document, uh, uh, Martin Luther King Jr.'s letter from a Birmingham jail. Some of you may have read it or are familiar with it. I, this semester I'm teaching a course at Baylor called Contemporary Moral Problems, and I have my students uh, during the first two weeks of the semester read King's letter as well as the Platonic dialogue, the Crito. I don't know if you're familiar with Crito. It's a, it, 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 Socrates is in prison, and his friend Crito comes there to try to convince him to escape. And in the letter from Birmingham jail, King is in jail, and he's writing a letter in defense of his civil disobedience. And so I thought it would be interesting for the students to compare and contrast two figures who are 2,500 years apart uh, dealing with the question of imprisonment and trying to justify their actions. Uh, Socrates justifies not escaping by appealing to what he thinks are unassailable moral principles. And King defends his civil disobedience by appealing to unassailable moral principles. And that's why he concludes that there are laws that are unjust and aren't really laws. And there he actually cites in his defense not only Socrates, but Thomas Aquinas and, and St. Augustine. So some other things about the natural law, it's the sort of reasoning, without the, this sort of reasoning, the reasoning you find in King and, and, and the Credo and other places, it's difficult to make sense of documents such as the Declaration of Independence, the, or the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, or some of the comments made by Justice uh, uh, Robert Jackson in his opening statements in the Nuremberg Trials. I don't know if you've uh, if ever studied the Nuremberg Trials, but R Justice Robert Jackson, who was an associate justice of the Supreme Court, was the lead attorney for the Allied powers in the prosecution of the Nazi war criminals. And it was actually quite controversial at the time to have the Nuremberg Trials because the argument at the time was that it would be wrong to prosecute even war criminals when there actually was no positive law that they were obviously violating. And part of Robert Jackson's case was that they had violated laws against humanity, that they had committed crimes against humanity. In other words, appealing to this understanding of the natural law. The counter to that, I mean, there were people at the time that thought the Nazis should be prosecuted or, or they should be punished, but they didn't like the idea of the Nuremberg trials. They thought it was came too close to sounding like post facto law. And so one writer for the Atlantic uh, Monthly said they should just be taken out to the Black Forest and shot. 
without a trial. And uh, the counter to that on the part of those that defended Nuremberg is that we have to teach people the importance of even giving the Nazi war criminals due process. <laughs> that that, that what, what the way we differ from how they've conducted themselves is that we believe that even people that have been accused of heinous crimes are entitled to a defense. Again, appealing to a kind of natural law reasoning. And the Nuremberg trials uh, occurred and, and, and many were prosecuted. Uh, you could actually watch if you want to. If you, uh, the, um, you, there are films of the executions on YouTube if, if, you can, if you're the sort of person that can watch that kind of thing. Um, most people can't. So, now it turns out that even the new atheists agree. Now, who are the new atheists? They're, they're really not new anymore. Um, for many of you, you were like in grammar school when they first published their, 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 their books. Uh, in the early 2000s, there were uh, four writers, uh, Richard Dawkins, Christopher Hitchens, Sam Harris, and Daniel Dennett that published best-selling books defending atheism. Uh, Hitchens is, is, is uh, no longer with us, but uh, Harris and, 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 and Dawkins are, and so is Dennett. And it's interesting, if you read their books, especially Dennett, excuse, excuse me, especially Dawkins and Hitchens, some of their criticisms of religious belief presuppose a kind of natural moral law. So, for example, uh, Dawkins uh, says, the atheist view is correspondingly life-affirming and life-enhancing, while at the same time never being tainted with self-delusion, wishful thinking, or the wingering self-pity of those who feel that life owes them something. So to kind of unpack that, I mean, there's a lot of moral presuppositions there, right? Uh, one is that uh, it's good to affirm life, right? There's a presupposition of the importance of human flourishing, that self-delusion is bad. Right? This kind of presupposes a kind of ordered self, right? That we're obligated to actually uh, respond to in an appropriate way. Um, by the way, how many of you know where that cartoon is from? Okay, I just wanted to find it. <laughs> it's one of my favorite episodes, by the way. Um, so Christopher Hitchens, Chris, they're, they're a much better writer than Dawkins. Um, violent, irrational, intolerant, allied to racism and tribalism and bigotry, invested in ignorance and hostile to free inquiry, contemptuous of women and coercive toward children, organized religion ought to have a great deal on its conscience. Right. So what you find here in Hitchens are certain moral judgments, very strong moral judgments, claims that, uh, in a sense, presuppose that there is something that we are morally obligated to abide by apart from governments, right? Because clearly he would not accept the argument that, oh, the people in the past just simply had a different understanding than us, uh, because after all, everything's relative. He wouldn't accept that at all. He would say that, no, the, the wickedness of these religious practitioners is a judgment that is always true. Right? So it seems as though that we have a kind of, most people have some kind of moral intuition, a moral intuitions about acting, or how they ought to act in terms of acting justly and fairly. Right. So now I want to move on. Um, now that we've gone over what, what exactly is meant by the natural law, uh, I want to talk about what does it mean when we, when we make a moral claim. So here I want to make four observations about the natural law. And, and much of what I'm going to say here comes from a, uh, a book I co-authored with a Gregory Kokel called Relativism, Feet Firmly Planted in Midair. It came out 22 years ago. And uh, Greg's uh, second to last chapter, he, the one he authored, uh, much of what I say here, it's, it's slightly edited. It's a little different than the way Greg presents it. Um, it comes from that, that contribution. 
so by the way, when I talk about the nature of the moral law, what I'm, what I'm asking is what kind of thing is the moral law? So if I ask the question, what kind of thing is a face mask, right? You can say that it's a physical thing made out of cloth and it has a particular shape and size and it fits over my face. You can sort of describe what it is, right? If I ask you, what is a human being? And if you are, let's say, uh, deeply well-read in Aristotelian philosophy, you would say human beings are rational animals, right? Or something along those lines, right? You would, you would give some kind of definition uh, of what it is, right? So what I'm saying here about the moral law is, well, what, what can we say about it that, that, we seem, that we seem to know? So four observations about the natural moral law. If the moral law exists, it is not physical. It's not a physical thing. It does not have physical properties. It has no extension, weight, chemical characteristics, and we don't discover it by empirical observation. Or at least empirical observation as understood by the hard sciences. Because there's a sense in which if you mean empirical as simply experience, you could say that you can learn the moral law through experience, but it's not the sort of thing that can sort of be tested, right, in the same way if, let's say, you test a scientific theorem. Uh, it's discovered through reflection and introspection, non-inferential acts of understanding. If a natural moral law truly exists and is not physical, then materialism as a worldview is false. Secondly, so here I have different physical things, including uh, uh, the Milky Way galaxy, the Rolling Stones, and I, I think that's a Geiger counter. I'm not, not sure. Um, second observation about morality, uh, moral laws are a form of communication. Um, here, all I'm saying is that they have cognitive content. It's not to say that people can't disagree about the precise meaning of a moral term or idea. So if I say, for example, uh, let's say I'm in a political debate and I say policy X is unfair, you may think that it's fair and we can have a debate about it. And when we get into sort of the nitty gritty details, it may turn out that we have slightly different understandings of what constitutes fairness. But at the end of the day, there is going to be enough commonality where we can have a conversation. In other words, there's cognitive content to it. Um, moral laws uh, are propositions that can be in the forms of imperatives, like one ought to keep one's promises, commands, keep your promises, and descriptions, like true knowledge is good. Third observation about the moral law, moral laws have an incumbency to them. Another way of putting it, they have an oughtness to them. You have a sense of a kind of tugging at your heart. I think we've, we should have all experienced this at least once in our life, maybe more. If you've never experienced it, that's not good. <laughs> uh, it's a sense of obligation, a sense of a kind of con your conscience talking to you like the little Homer angel is talking, right? Uh, I remember when I was a teenager, uh, I was invited to speak at a youth group at a church, and I really wanted, didn't want to do it. And I remember kind of this, this real sense of incumbency. <laughs> you should do what you promised, right? And, and again, we've, we've all, we should have all ha had this experience of some, of, of some sort. And, and it could either work in, in, in one direction in the sense of, keep, let's say, keeping a promise. It could also work in another direction, right? Resisting, let's say, temptations, right? The, the, but this is the kind of incumbency of morality. Right? And it's something that's different than, let's say, um, let's say, our relationship to other sets of ideas. We don't have this about mathematics, for example. Even though mathematics, if it's real, is immaterial and universal and unchanging. Yet nobody sort of you know, feels guilty about 2 plus 2 equals 5. 
right? So there's a kind of oughtness in math, but it doesn't have the same kind of oughtness, right, that you do in, with moral claims. And finally, violating moral laws typically results in deep discomfort. When we violate clear moral rules, we have an ethical pain, a sense that we deserve to be punished. This is called guilt. Only sociopaths succeed in overcoming their conscience completely. So it's something that everyone, unless they're a saint or a sociopath, has had. Right? It's what uh, Greg calls a sense of ethical pain. So, to review, four observations about the natural moral law. If the moral law exists, it, it's not physical. It's not a physical thing. Uh, the moral law is a form of communication. It has cognitive content. The moral law has, it, has an incumbency to it. And then finally, violating the moral law typically, or ought to result, in deep discomfort. So, does the moral law require a divine source? And what I'm going to talk about here is also slightly adapted from Greg's contribution to our book, as well as a chapter from my own book, uh, the last chapter of my own book, Politics for Christians. So there, there, I'm going to go over three options here. Uh, there are probably are more options. Uh, I have a, a book chapter that I published about 18 years ago where I go over some other options about the origin or the source of the moral law. There's one that's fairly well known for um, students of political philosophy, uh, a kind of state of nature view of morality, and we don't have time to go over that. Uh, but what I've decided to do is to go over three options. Um, and the first option is that the moral law is relative. The second option is the moral law is a mere accident, a product of chance. And third, the moral law is grounded in a transcendent mind. So let's go over, the but of the three up there, I mean, in terms of what is at least the most popular among certain academics that write in, 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 in this area, um, or, or those that, that uh, want to sort of reject any sort of, of um, moral law as a real thing. Uh, the second is the most, um, the most prominent, and we're going to spend a little bit more time on that one. And it's usually connected to what is sometimes called sociobiology, uh, and, and uh, its defenders include, most notably, uh, Michael Roos and E.O. Wilson. Uh, Roos is a philosopher, E.O. Wilson, a scientist at Harvard. He's retired now. So let's just talk about, we'll just briefly mention relativism. Um, uh, I'm not going to spend any time on relativism. Uh, I'm assuming that, uh, that everything that I said at the very beginning when talking about uh, uh, the natural moral law, uh, my citations of Dawkins and Hitchens, that even they accept in some degree an understanding of morality that is not conventional, that's not dependent on uh, human institutions, that there's a sense in which uh, there is something beyond uh, ourselves when it comes to uh, the moral law. Um, there's a whole other lecture here <laughs> on what's wrong with relativism, and we don't have time to go over that. That's why I began with citing just a wide variety of people who, held, who hold to some view of a natural moral law, even uh, atheists like uh, Hitchens and Dawkins. Uh, Although, I'll tell you one story. Uh, this is, it was a class I was teaching at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. I, I, my first job was at UNLV. Uh, I actually grew up in Las Vegas. And after earning my PhD, I got hired at UNLV, and I was teaching a class. And I had a student 
very bright student, and she would always challenge me in class, which I very much encourage in, in, in my students. And she asked me when we were going over the issue of relativism, she said, she said, why is the truth important? And I answered, do you want the true answer or the false one? So the point is that sometimes, it's not really a, it's not really a, a that, that quip is not really a defense of, of the natural moral law, but it's, it's a lesson that sometimes the answer to your question is sort of baked into the question. Right, so, so when, when, when somebody raises the question about the natural moral law and has skepticism about it, if you think about it, the very inquiry presupposes that we are in fact rational creatures entitled to reasons, which actually itself kind of presupposes a kind of respect and dignity that we should tr by which we should treat one another. So intellectual in inquiry, I think in and of itself, presupposes a whole cluster of moral assumptions. Uh, we would tend to call them intellectual virtues, but I do think they're also moral virtues as well. All right, so let's go to the second option. The moral law is mere accident, a product of chance. And here I want to go over two options. One I call sub-option A, and this is the... Um, what I call the brute fact argument, uh, and it goes something like this. M the moral law is just a brute fact. It just exists. It, it's, it's just there. And it's always been there as long as Homo sapiens have been here, but there's no need to try to explain it. It's, it's just there. Um, it requires no explanation. But it seems to me that the appeal to a brute fact is like sweeping the dirt into the trash can or under the rug and then claiming that there's no longer any dirt. A contingent fact, like the moral law by its nature, cannot account for itself. Also, a moral law, moral laws that have no ground or justification, need not be obeyed. So imagine if while playing Scrabble, the letters randomly spell go to Baltimore or persevere. Should you obey the command? Or supposing you're eating alphabet soup and your name is Bob and you have a fairly large spoon and the letters happen to spell B-O-B. -B, does that mean that your soup is actually communicating with you? Now, I would be concerned if your name were Nebuchadnezzar, and, and whoa, you know, uh, that would be, uh, you know, or Thurston Howell III or something like that. You, you should be probably, you know, either seek help or, uh, you know, seek out a priest or an exorcist. <laughs> um, so wh why don't we obey those commands? Because a chance-created phrase... Um, uh, isn't actually communication, right? So, so you, let's say I drove into College Station, and uh, you don't have that many hills here, but so for this illustration to work, let's imagine there's a mountain in College Station. On the side of the mountain, it says, Welcome to College Station, and I pull into Texas A&M, and I check in at the hotel, and I tell the woman at the front desk, oh, it's nice that you have on the side of the mountain, welcome to College Station, I feel warmly welcomed. And she says, oh, that's, that's not supposed to be there. I said, well, what do you mean? Well, we used to have a big letter factory there, and there's a really bad fire, and it blew up, and the letters happened to fall to spell welcome to College Station. So we're really not welcoming you. That would change, no longer is that statement really a statement anymore. Right? There's actually no mind behind it. it. Chance may possibly create the appearance of a moral command, but since no one is speaking uh, such a command, we can safely ignore it. All right, so let's move on now to the, ex the next 
uh, option, sub-option B for the claim the moral law is a mere accident, a product of chance. And this is far more sophisticated. This is the view that the moral law is a product of naturalistic ev evolution. And this is the option that is offered by Michael Roos and E.O. Wilson. Now, I say naturalistic evolution because I don't believe that uh, Darwinian evolution is inconsistent with belief in God. Uh, so I, I, I want to clear, I just, that's why I call it naturalistic evolution. That is a view that everything that we see today in terms of or, living organisms is the result of a process behind which there is no providence. Okay. Um, so what is the Roos-Wilson option? Let me, well, before I go over the problems, let me read to you uh, something that they say in an article called The Evolution of Ethics, which was published in 1984. In fact, in the class that I, I mentioned earlier, the one that I'm teaching this semester at Baylor, uh, my students read uh, this article uh, before we get into actual moral issues uh, like abortion and, and physician-assisted suicide and so forth. We talk about what are called meta-ethical issues. What is the sort of grounding of ethics? And so one of the issues we deal with is, is the Wilson uh, Roos essay. And um, so this is what, uh, this is what uh, Wilson and, and Roos say in their essay. The question is not whether biology, specifically our evolution, is connected with ethics, but how. As evolutionists, we see that no justification of the traditional kind is possible. Morality, or more strictly, our belief in morality, is merely an adaptation put in place to further our reproductive ends. Hence, the basis of ethics does not lie in God's will. In an important sense, ethics, as we understand it, is an illusion fobbed on us by our genes to get us to cooperate. It is without external grounding. Ethics is illusory inasmuch as it persuades us that it has an objective reference. This is the crux of the biological position. Once it is grasped, everything falls into place." Unquote. So what are they saying here? They're saying that for human beings to, as living organisms, to survive and pass on their genetic materials to the next generation, holding the belief that there is a real moral law is advantageous. But ultimately, there is no moral law to which it refers. Now, one of the interesting things that, about the Roos Wilson article is they pretty much say that everything that I talked about early on about these kind of beliefs, general beliefs that people have about the good, are fairly universal. But they want to say that there is no actual referent to a real moral law. We sort of have been deceived by our genes. All right, does everyone follow that? So there's a there's a so so it's not that they are saying they're not saying that people don't believe it or they don't act as if it's true. Generally, they're saying that there actually is no real moral law, and I think the one of the motivations for this on the part of Roos and Wilson is that they understand that if, in fact, there is a reference, something that Michael, he's, Michael Roos is a friend of mine, uh, we just had an exchange, uh, in, uh, a, a textbook just came out on, on, on ethics, and we were invited to, to kind of debate each other in the textbook. And so one of the things that, that Michael argues, he, he says that if, in fact, there is this kind of reference, then it would mean that he thinks it would be odd. It wouldn't fit sort of his materialistic kind of scientific view of the world. And so one thing that's motivating him is that. And for this reason, he also thinks that something like mathematics uh, doesn't, it, it is, is not, he's, he's an anti-realist when it comes to something like mathematics because he sees that once you concede that uh, abstract objects like mathematical objects could be real, uh, that means that there would have to be something like uh, either a platonic 
realm of ideal entities or eternally in the mind of God, and neither of which is consistent with what he believes is the best worldview in terms of accounting for the way in which we live, namely this kind of materialistic, scientific materialism. Okay, so um, what's wrong with this view? I'm going to go over some cri cri criticisms of it. Um, first criticism the naturalist evolutionary theory of the, of the natural moral law cannot properly account for motive and intent. This, mere, this theory merely describes behavior, but morality entails more, inclu more, including motive and intent. One can be immoral without any behavior simply on the basis of motive and intent. Um, so, for example, uh, supposing I tell you that, you know, the police are after me and I'm going to hide in room, what room are we in right now? 2406? So, so I say I'm going to hide in 2408. I don't know if there really is a 2408, but let's pretend there is. So I'm going to hide in 2408. Um, uh, but then when I go there, I kind of have doubts about you. So I decide to go to 2410. And so you wind up telling the police officer 2410 because you want to protect me. You actually wind up telling him the truth, but you've acted immorally because you intended to deceive. On the other hand, you could say, 2408, after I'd moved to 2410, even though what you said was false, you didn't lie. <laughs> so we, we, we make judgments about people's actions, oftentimes based on their motive and intent, not necessarily the consequences. So an example that C.S. Lewis uses in his book, Mere Christianity, he talks about the young man that attempts to trip a woman on the train and he doesn't succeed and she's fine and compares that to another young man who actually accidentally trips the woman. And we, we typically, and she's, let's say, hurt, we typically would say that the second acted, you may say act negligently, but he clearly was not as immoral as the person that intentionally tried it, right? But remember for, for um, Roos and um, uh, uh, Wilson, it's all about the behavior, right? It's all about the physical acts. It seems as though there's more to, to, to morality than that. Second problem, why be good tomorrow? So here I want to argue that the best that the Roos-Wilson theory can do is describe how we have acquired our moral sentiments. So it's a great, it's a story that says, look, the reason why sometimes you feel an incumbency to be kind or to act altruistically is because those types of feelings have advantageous survival value. That's why you have them. And I, for all I know, that's absolutely correct, right? That's how I acquired them but it doesn't tell me why I should obey them. Why is it I should follow this moral rule that I should be kind? Now, you could tell a kind of um, like self a story, an egoistic story. You can say, well, because it'll, it'll benefit you. Yeah, but that's not really, doesn't tells me why it, it, it's just good to be altruistic in itself. Right? So the best that it does, it seems to me, it tells me that, um, uh, doesn't tell me how I ought to act on those feelings. It just tells me that how I acquired them. And, and even if you, if you look at, let's say, people in the past, our, our, our predecessors, all the people that existed for thousands of years 
who acted and behaved in ways that eventually resulted in us and our moral intuitions. But if you look at human history, it's a pretty strange bunch, isn't it? It includes all sorts of people, right? People that we consider saints, people that we consider wicked, right? How do we, how, the, how we distinguish who the saints and the wicked people are? I mean, wh why, why follow the people that we think were saints and not the wicked ones? How, in other words, you need a kind of morality above morality by which to assess people in the past. In fact, one of the great mysteries of, of morality and something that C.S. Lewis brings in, up in his first five chapters of Mere Christianity is that we, we have this sense of what we ought to do and at the same time, we know we don't live up to it. So it's not really a matter of sort of counting noses, right? Saying, oh, well, most people think this way. Most people know what's right, and most people know that they sometimes don't act consistently with it. That's the mystery. All right. Um, problem three. It proves too much. It proves too much. Why don't we, why don't we apply Roos's, Roos and Wilson's theory to all our beliefs? If one's belief in the moral law can be attributed entirely to survival value rather than to a real moral law, why not apply the same reasoning to our other beliefs? Why aren't the other beliefs that my cognitive faculties entertain subject to the same sort of analysis. After all, the same mind that entertains moral beliefs also can, entertains beliefs about art, literature, science, philosophy, mathematics, and the existence of other people. Perhaps they too deceive me as well and really don't refer to anything except to beliefs that help me survive. So here's a thing I found online. Um, the statement on the back of this shirt is false, and the statement on the front of this shirt is true. <laughs> There's a kind of self-refuting aspect to this. That is, if, if, if the intuitions that most people have that there's a natural moral law refer, don't refer to a real moral law, and it's the result of the development of our cognitive faculties as a result of evolution, well, why select the moral law as the one that doesn't refer to anything real rather than all our other intuitions and deliverances of reason. There's another way to put it. If our biology tricks us into believing that there's a natural moral law, perhaps our biology tricks us into believing that our biology tricks us into believing that there's a natural moral law. All right. So option three, the option I think is the correct option. What sort of intelligence, if we, if we accept the third option, the natural law is grounded in a transcendent mind, what sort of intelligence this, could this be? Um, so let me just, before I go into that, let me just briefly summarize what we've done so far. Given that options one and two fail, or at least I think they fail, and given our four observations about the nature of the moral law, it must have its source in an intelligence. But only a transcendent one, a mind that can by its nature be the same, be the source of the natural moral law. So it can't be a finite mind or a contingent intelligence, one whose existence and moral authority is dependent on something else outside itself. For in order to be the ground of the moral law, a being must not receive its existence and moral authority for, from another, for that being, if it is not contingent, would then be the ground of the natural moral law. And here I have up on the screen all sorts of kind of superhuman figures from both mythology and contemporary cinema, right? There is Q from Star Trek. I don't know if you guys are Star Trek fans. Um, and then Thor and uh, Spock, right? So. If you say, well, you know, the source of the moral law are simply, you know, a kind of 
super version of, of human beings, but somehow superior, uh, they, the, the same problem, you're just sort of pushing the problem back just one, one generation, right, so to speak. So therefore, the source of the moral law must be a self-existent, perfect, perfect being, perfectly good being, who has the juridical authority that requires that we owe him our duty to obey. It seems only fitting to call such a being God. And here I'm going to conclude with a quote from the philosopher Richard Taylor. A duty is something that is owed, but something can be owed only to some person or persons. There can be no such thing as a duty in isolation. The concept of a moral obligation is unintelligible apart from the idea of God. The words remain, but the meaning is gone. Thank you, and look forward to hearing your questions. Thank you. So we have, uh, I guess, some time. So um, any questions? I'll get this guy in the back. I don't know if I may not hear you. Oh, I'll try to be loud. Uh, so uh, on point two, Bravo, point two B there. Um, just trying to understand it a little bit. So, like, we have a king, for example, or, or someone with a lot of money and power, prestige, whatever is defined power as. Uh, they would still like they need to act in such a way. But now that they have gained the human knowledge that this is just biology telling them that they're that way. Oh. They can say, I now know biology is telling me this is still this way. So I shouldn't feel guilty because I don't need to rely on anyone since I'm in a position of power. I can kill people and win. So then someone like Hitler, in that case, would not, if there was no moral justification, then since he didn't need to rely on anyone, it wouldn't be bad because there is no bad in that case. Yeah, now, now Roos, Roos addresses this in, in, in his essay um, and I don't think he gives a very convincing answer. I mean, he basically says that he, he kind of like a, a kind of a hand wave. He said, we need not, you know, uh, draw, come to the conclusion that it would be permissible to do all, all these things. Uh, after all, these, you know, the, these, these uh, uh, what is it, uh, altruistic um, reflexes or, or inclinations are there for our good. Uh, I'm not sure that's, uh, that's not that convincing to me. And uh, so, yeah, because I, 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 one, one of the things he brings up, he brings up the very question you raised, basically, now that you know the inside information, <laughs> right? You know, doesn't that, you don't want too many people to know this, right? I mean, you go and you start preaching the gospel of Roos and Wilson, people will, Start saying, "Hey, there is no, you know, external grounding of morality. I can do what I want." And he, his answer is, "Well, you know, we, we acquired these inclinations for probably a good evolutionary reason, so don't tinker with them." But it actually doesn't tell us why the individual can't do it, right? I mean, it does give you a good kind of species argument, right? Well, it's good for the species, but you know, I mean, just. Why should I care about the species, right? I mean, I'll be gone, and I'm, I turn 60 next week, so I, maybe I'll, I won't be around in 40 years, you know? That, so there's, you know, so yeah, they, he, he anticipates that objection. I'm not all that convinced it's a, it's a good one. There, there probably are better responses, so I don't want to give you the impression that, you know, that, that Roos is the, the, you know, sort of the end, the be-all and end-all of, of a response to that, but... But I've not read any, any others that are, are too dissimilar from, from Roos's. No. You had your hand raised? Yeah. Uh, yes, sir. I was wondering, um, in response to the claim uh, that the biological, uh, the, uh, we have just evolved to have these moral beliefs, and the question of why doesn't that extend to scientific beliefs and beliefs about other things, somebody might say um, that they are qualitatively different and so therefore aren't touched. Um, so perhaps empirical claims are obviously better grounded. 
Um, so what would you say, that, how would you argue that they are in fact in the same category with respect to um, just as likely to be false beliefs from evolution? Yeah, so, so the, the way to think about this is that every belief that we have is in our minds, right? I mean, and so it seems as though our beliefs about about science, I mean, they're pretty well grounded, right? In the sense that, you know, I make, you know, let's say I'm a scientist, I engage in a particular type of experiment, I offer a particular theory, uh, it, you know, and I can demonstrate it. But don't forget, the person doing that is the person with the mind. <laughs> Right, so, so all the beliefs themselves are, I mean, there's not a kind of, um, you can't sort of uh, jump out of the observer's skin, you know. So, uh, and I would, I would argue that some moral beliefs are actually more, we're more certain of certain moral beliefs than we are of scientific beliefs. So I, I am more certain that it's wrong to torture children for fun that then that uh, Einstein's second theory of relativity is correct. I mean, I can easily imagine Einstein being overturned, but I can't imagine ever coming to the belief that it's right to torture children for fun, right? So if you think about it, a lot of our our moral beliefs are we're more certain of, right? Right. So think about how you know what what would be worse. Let's say if let's say you stood outside at Texas A and M and you said. You, you stood on, you know, and you started yelling out, I believe in genocide, right? What would happen to you, right? It's not going to be pleasant, right? And you probably deserve it, right? But if you stood up and you said, I think Darwinian evolution is wrong, people would laugh at you maybe or, or you know, make fun, but they're not going to think of you as a moral monster, right? They'll think that there's something wrong with your cognitive equipment or something like that, or they think you, you were mistaken, but they wouldn't... Or if you stood up and you said, maybe a better, maybe a better example would be, I think, I think that um, uh, there are subatomic particles that exceed the speed of light, right? That are that are more than theoretical; that they are actually real. You're, there are people who disagree with you, but they're not going to think, well, that's impossible or that's crazy or that's. Ins but they will think that if you stood up and said defending genocide. So it turns out that I think if we think about it, we probably are more certain about much of our moral beliefs, a lot more certain than we are about even our scientific ones. Yes? Um, just a response to your, um, I guess, dismantling of the argument that... Could you speak a little louder? I'm sorry. I'm, I'm just, I'm um, losing. I, I, by the way, this is, this is my posture at Baylor in the classroom. Can you just, I'm, I'm like this all the time. So, yeah. So the way you explained that it can't be just an evolution of a moral code was like, it doesn't explain for our intentions and that it's, there needs to be more than a continuation of the species, but if, are we not known only by our actions because we can't specifically always input the intentions when we're judging someone's action? And also, like your third point is that uh, there would, like, how do we know about our biology isn't tricking us into believing our biology is tricking us? If their argument is that it's for the continuation of a species, what advantage would biology have to trick us into tricking us? If that makes any sense. I'm not sure I understand. I, uh, let me respond to the, the first part. So you're, say the first part again. Um, so the first part was that, you know, I think my biology is tricking me. That's so go ahead. it doesn't explain our intentions, but are we not known by our actions? Not okay. Our intentions? Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, obviously, intentions are more difficult to detect than actions, but they're not undetectable, right? There's different ways you can detect intentions, right? Uh, uh, one way you can detect intentions is uh, really the result of kind of almost universal experience, right? So it, we have laws, uh, laws in tort and criminal law that uh, explain or try to account for how to figure out intentions. Now, they're not foolproof, right? I mean, you could have sort of unusual cases where it seems that someone could be acting in exactly the same way in our experience a person has acted who's intending to kill another person. But if you saw somebody, for example, um, 
you know, walk into a room, pull out a gun and say, hey, Fred, I hate you. <laughs> you shoot them, right? You know what's, what's going on, right? Um, so yeah, it, it's clear that motives and intents are, are motive and intent is, is more difficult to detect, but, it, but there's different ways in which we can, we can figure this out, right? One way is people just admitting this is their intent. I mean, they could be lying, but generally people, you know, will, will, will tell you the truth about that. Uh, there's also kind of old tried and true ways by which people act that we have sort of as accumulation of human experience concluded that uh, it reveals something of their intent, right? Um, there's also um, uh, so I, I'm, I'm starting to th I'm starting to think of, and I don't want to get into this. But there's these sort of these these weird uh, kind of puzzles in law, like where um, uh, you can you can be prosecuted for um, a, a killing someone you didn't intend to kill for, for first degree murder. So let's say I'm going to try to shoot you, but you bend over and I shoot the guy behind you. Uh, it sort of get, it, it gets transferred. Words, I still can be prosecuted because I can't say, well, I didn't intend to kill him. It was the other guy. That's not going to that's not going to. It's, that's not going to uh, be an argument that, that, that would be accepted. So, yeah, so there's different ways that we can, but clearly it's more difficult to be sure. But, but even if we, uh, uh, even if we sort of reflect on our own selves, right? So uh, we, we, you don't have to actually know about other people. You can know about yourself, right? So if you donate money to, let's say, a charity because you, you, you're sort of moved by the plight of the people that are being helped by the charity versus, let's say, doing it because you want to impress your girlfriend, right? That's, so you know that even though externally people will see you act the same way, you know that, that one is, has a different intent over the other. So, so the other one, the other question, the other part of your question has to do with the, the, the biological trick part. Oh, because ob obeying uh, obeying the moral law um, allows for uh, human beings to be altruistic in a way that preserves the species. So, for example, um, the typical inclination that parents have to protect their children. Um, in a weird way, it's almost as if, to use Dawkins' language, it's almost as if our selfish gene has an interest in us becoming altruistic. <laughs> and so that, that would be, uh, so, so over time, we develop these moral rules about parents and children, or even about uh, those closest to us, right? So uh, think about some of the great, um, you know, uh, great works and films, right? Uh, in Star Wars, Darth Vader is really the father of who? Luke Skywalker, right? And Oedipus marries his mother, right? And kills his father, but doesn't know, right? And once that knowledge is there, does it change everything? And so, so, there's a, so these kind of inclinations that we have, I mean, they serve according to Roos and Wilson, the human species. Now, I want to say one thing, though, about, I, I do think that it could be, and this is, I think, as, as a Christian and a Catholic, I think this is perfectly consistent with my faith, it could be that Roos and Wilson are entirely correct that human beings evolved in such a way that these sentiments sort of become, in a sense, part of who we are once we get a rational soul. Uh, but it doesn't mean, but it, simply because it does refer to something real. <laughs> so it could be that the evolutionary story in terms of what Roos and Wilson are saying is correct insofar as, yeah, uh, it was advantageous for us to sort of uh, acquire these reflexes and intuitions. But just like we, we acquired rational faculties which refer to a real world, we acquired moral faculties that refer to a real moral law. So that, to me, there's no reason to totally dismiss what Roos and Wilson say. 
fact, when we go over this in class at Baylor, I, I have my students read C.S. Lewis's uh, first five chapters of Mere Christianity. And one of the, my students always notice that Lewis and, and Roos and Wilson actually both agree that human beings have this kind of intuition of the moral law. And it's, it's almost kind of eerie to read Christ, uh, C.S. Lewis, this great Christian writer, arguing for God's existence from morality, and these two atheists appealing to the exact same data about human civilization and culture. But of course, Lewis comes to an entirely different conclusion. So, yes? Uh, this is a question from the Zoom. Okay. Uh, if God is indeed the ground of natural law, how do we deal with sources of divine revelation that seem to run contrary to our perception of the natural law? Oh. For example, examples of violence in the Old Testament. That's a great question. I will. I, I, I could do the, uh, which I typically do. I'm a philosopher, not a theologian, uh, which is true. I, I will admit I've not, I, I'll give you, there's, there's a couple answers. I'll give you Aquinas. Aquinas' answer, Thomas Aquinas' answer is, those cases are, are in fact, they really happened and God ordered them, but God is the giver and taker of life and it's within his purview to make those kind of judgments. Human beings are simply instruments of his will. That's, so it's not them acting, but God acting through them. I'd say, in fact, that was the typical response to those passages. Um, gosh, uh, I remember years ago, there was a book by an uh, uh, evangelical the Old Testament scholar, Gleason Archer, called The Encyclopedia of Bible Difficulties. Uh, which I read uh, as part of my, my, my first graduate degree. And that was Gleason Archer's answer, too. Uh, I think a lot of people would find that answer unsatisfying. Uh, I think philosophically it's not a bad answer, uh, but it's still, it's still for, for a lot of people, they think, well, that puts God in the position of doing that. But for traditional classical theists, God is the... There's no moral law above God. God is the source of the moral law. And the creatures he creates have natures, and they act consistently with those natures. And so, so that's the one. The other answer is one that, again, this is not an area that I, that I know a lot about. I'm not, a, I'm not a biblical scholar. But in recent years, there have been several books published by evangelical scholars that are quite good in this regard. One is by Paul Copan, who is a philosopher at Palm Beach Atlantic University, and the other is Matthew Fla uh, Flanagan, who uh, is a new, uh, scholar out of New Zealand. He's a philosopher, and they argue that these passages are um, kind of Near Eastern exaggerations in order to kind of uh, uh, show the triumph of God. And so that's a sort of that's sort of a whole different biblical hermeneutic than let's say Aquinas was using. Again, it's not something that I'm that's I, I feel that I'm even close to being an expert on. But but those are the uh, so I would I would encourage the the, uh, the Zoomer, I guess is that the right term? I don't know what the um, I encourage the Zoomer to, to look up Paul Copan and Matthew Matthew Flanagan. So Yes. So, um, yeah, just like on it, one more. Um, so, okay, so assuming that the natural law, as you put it, is sourced with a um, transcendent, intelligent mind, then we can only know of it based off how that mind communicates with us, correct? So, then how can a society legislate? laws and claim them to be moral if we don't agree on how that mind is communicated with us? Yes. So that's a really good question. So um, if you, in, in the Summa Theologica, what Aquinas gives an account of the natural law, which actually is quite modest. He doesn't think you can get an awful lot out of natural reason when it comes to the natural moral law but that that's why you need special revelation. But he does believe that human civilizations in one way or another are going to exhibit in their laws the natural law, but sometimes they could get it slightly wrong 
because human beings have an inclination towards uh, corruption and sin. So to give an example that, that, that C.S. Lewis uses, I, I keep on citing Lewis, but Lewis is, I think, in terms of contemporary writers, maybe the best presenter of natural law thinking for people that, uh, let's say, don't have a strong background in, in philosophy. So in his book, The Abolition of Man, which I encourage all of you to read if you haven't read it already, he says that the natural law, which he calls the Tao, he says the natural law is kind of like um, the primary colors. You can't invent a new primary color, but you can distort it through the prism, right? Or you can merge the primary colors, or you can come up with extreme versions of the natural law, which are in fact not good. And he gives an example. He said, he says, look, it's a natural inclination to have what is sometimes called um, filial piety, that is love of one's parents. It's a natural inclination for one to have a kind of national piety or uh, the, towards one na one's nation, kind of love of one's nation. But those could be taken to an extreme. So uh, uh, he uses the example in mere Christianity, a mother has maternal love to, the, to her child, and that's a good thing. But if her love goes so far as to, um, let's say, uh, protect a child who had committed a crime, what you see in that is actually the natural law of that a mother ought to love her child, but what's missing from it is a kind of correct judgment about her obligations to the civil and criminal law. So how does it get cashed out in different cultures and civilizations? So Lewis, uh, in, in both The Abolition of Man and Mere Christianity, says, uh, nowhere do you find, uh, people will say, people will condemn cowardice and praise courage. But people will disagree about whether particular cases of courage, what, whether particular cases are in fact real cases of courage or cowardice. Uh, people will, every civilization has laws on marriage. So, and this is from mere Christianity before, long before there was anything called same-sex marriage. But he, he says, uh, some civilizations allowed polygamy whereas others only allow monogamy, but all forbade, said that, say that you can't just take anyone as your spouse. <laughs> so he says that, that these kinds of, uh, of natural inclinations that we have, because we're ordered towards these good ends, are going to be reflected in cultures and civilizations, but they're going to come out differently given different circumstances and sometimes given... Um, certain corruptions of civilizations. An example that Aquinas uses in, Mere Christ, I mean, in the Summa Theologica, he talks about the Germanic tribes who did not believe it was wrong for them to steal. But, he, but the fact is, they didn't want their stuff stolen. <laughs> so that even though they engaged in these bad acts, they still realized that they were wrong. Um, so think about... One more example. Think about the differences um, between kind of public policy differences between nations on matters like health care or, or, let's say, freedom of speech. Uh, I think that, you know, all the nations that have different policies on these matters believe that their policies are trying to achieve the same end or good. And but they disagree about how best to achieve that. And it may turn out that as a result of those different policies, uh, there may be incentives for people to act badly and so forth. Uh, so, so for someone like Aquinas, he, in the Summa, he does provide an account, I think, of, on the one hand, why there's these, sort of these common human inclinations. On the other hand, why there's disagreement. And he says there's disagreement because uh, you know, people are inculcated badly <laughs> or they're nurtured badly. Um, secondly, uh, individuals can be driven by emotion, right? Um, and cultures or civilizations could 
simply just get certain things wrong because they get facts wrong. So I'll give you one more example, okay? It's one that I, I should have brought up earlier, but think about the debate about abortion. So people that support abortion rights or are pro-choice, at least among philosophers and people that write in bioethics, most of them will argue that the fetus is a human being, but they'll say the fetus is not a person. So what they mean by a person is a being that has certain characteristics, the ability, for example, the ability to think rationally, to have a life plan, and they say fetuses don't have that, so therefore they're not, they have no moral status, therefore abortion is justified. Pro-lifers, on the other hand, those that oppose abortion, argue that the unborn human being, yes, doesn't exercise those powers, but it is a person by nature that only needs maturation so that it can exercise those powers and to disrupt intentionally disrupt that maturation is, in fact, to harm that child. Now, the disagreement then isn't over the principle that it's wrong to kill persons without justification. The disagreement is about a deeper metaphysical question, what is a person? So, so, you, so you see, you know, the, the natural law is, is, is actually quite a modest thing. It's not meant to say anything more than, than that human beings are ordered towards particular goods that ultimately get reflected in laws but that doesn't mean human beings aren't going to disagree. All right. I think we're, let's see, let's have one more. Yeah. yeah. I had a question regarding uh, one of the previous statements that I think he was, he was bringing up uh, regarding this uh, second B yeah. um, reputation. Um, it seems to be an argument that comes with an inherent presupp presupposition in that, that the, that that is derived from the thinker's bias, um, that being, the naturalistic reputation, the naturalistic evolution seems to refute um, a evolution, or that the evolution is simply a mechanism that's guided by a transcendent mind. Um, so how do you think that Bruce would respond to the argument that his, you know, his contrary argument to the claim that there is a moral law um, seems to almost just be a parallel argument of simply an argument about mechanism, not necessarily the presence of. Yeah, that's, I, I, I don't, let me, correct me if I, I, if I get your, I think what I'm hearing you say that, that uh, Roos moving from the mechanism of evolution to the conclusion that it, the moral law isn't real doesn't follow. Yeah, yeah. so I, 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 think, I think for Michael, uh, he would say, and, and we've, we've, as we've had these exchanges, I think he would say that it would let a divine foot in the door and his entire sort of worldview would collapse. And, and I, I also think that he has, and again, I, I, I want to be careful here, I don't want to speak for him, but I, I, I suspect he has this kind of interventionist view of God uh, and it's something, part of my, my, my most recent book, which was, just came out last year with Baylor University Press called a Never Doubt Thomas. It's a, it's a very small book on, on Thomas Aquinas, and I have a chapter on uh, creation, intelligent design, and evolution. And one of the criticisms I level against both Roos and his intelligent design critics is they both seem to presuppose that if, that, uh, in the absence of evolutionary mechanisms, God kind of fills the gaps. And I think that's just a mistaken understanding of divine action. And I think Aquinas is a nice antidote to that. So I think he fears in a way that, and again, fears maybe is too strong. I think he, he thinks that to, to actually entertain that is to sort of suggest that something like intelligent design theory could be correct. But my response to Michael is that, no, you don't have to accept intelligent design theory to accept God because divine action doesn't need space and nature by which to act. And I think that's the sort of ironic kind of similarity between the new atheists and some of their uh, Christian critics is they tend to sort of accept the same assumption that uh, if, you, if you give a sort of perfect Darwinian account of biological evolution, therefore God is superfluous. But that's not at least the classical Christian view of God. The classical Christian view of God is that nature is contingent 
and that nature requires a being or the ground of being in order to keep it, to bring it and keep it in existence. And so we don't, it's weird as a why in other parts of science, we don't say that a complete explanation excludes God. So if I say, for example, I can give you a complete account of respiration. Well, then I'm going to be an atheist. Nobody, it's, it, and I think it has to do with, I think historical reasons having to do with the role that evolution played in the kind of um, conflicts in the early 20th century uh, concerning the Scopes trial, uh, and the and so and the fact that it that it conflicted with kind of the dominant Christian fundamentalist reading of the Book of Genesis, and I th- I think that's why that sticks out. But there's no other area of science where anybody says that somehow uh, uh, you know God as creator is excluded if you have a uh, an account that doesn't need to fit him in. So. All right, time for maybe one more question. Um, yes, sir. Um, so how would you argue to somebody who believes in multiple gods that the Christian Catholic God would be the ultimate source of moral law? Wow, that's a... <laughs> so someone who's a polytheist. Uh, well, uh, the first thing I would ask is... If, well, one argument that I would, would offer is that if you have many gods, uh, I mean, are they are they really gods? I mean, uh, I mean, I think we have to sort of get straight exactly what we mean by God. Now, if they mean by God something like just a being that is more powerful than human beings, somebody like Q in in Star Trek, uh, then that being itself would be a contingent being. That is to say. It's not the creator and sustainer of the universe, right? It would be uh, an entity that uh, has uh, a nature that from which we can distinguish its existence from its essence. So we can say, well, so you know, we say Apollo's a god, you know, um, Jupiter's a god. Uh, Fred is a god, right? Well, so there, you've got three gods, so they, they, each ha- they each have the nature of godhood, right? But they differ, right? So, um, and, and we can easily imagine them ceasing to exist, so they are not self-existent, right? So, so you, so, in other words, I would, I would, I you know, move in that direction. Uh, so it, it what would be really helpful uh, a, a book in this regard is uh, the recent book by by Ed Fazer uh, called Five, what is it, Five Proofs for God's Existence, published by Ignatius University Press. Uh, that's quite good. Uh, I don't know if you, any of you read Edward Fazer on, on, on line. He's a philosopher at Pasadena City College, uh, a... Uh, I don't know how he finds the time to write. Uh, he he has a, a blog where uh, where he uh, writes a lot of this stuff initially before he publishes it in book form. Uh, but I would encourage you to, to go to his blog where he's dealt with many of these many of these questions. So that would be my first. I would just simply raise the question about what what what, what exactly do you mean by God? And and obviously uh, uh, a finite God is really just another creature. It has uh, all the attributes of creatures, and it would require something to account for its existence. And in, at least according to the sort of classical view of God, such gods aren't really gods. So. All right, well, thank you very much, and uh, God bless you. <laughs> bye, bye.